In this spreadsheet, I have a list of a little over 550 dormitory rooms in two dorms, two made-up dorms on campus, Holderby East and Holderby West. And the goal here is to randomly select from all of these rooms 25 rooms to use for the purposes of our analysis. Now again, random doesn't mean just chosen willy-nilly. It means chosen in a way so that every dorm room in this, in this list of rooms has an exactly equal chance of being included in our sample of 25 rooms. So we're going to do this using random numbers, and then we're going to sort by the random numbers. First of all, let's type a column header, random, in column D here, and then let's type the formula for, for generating a random number. It's just equal, rand, and then two parentheses, a left parenthesis and a right parenthesis, and hit enter. And just like that, Excel has generated a random number, in this case 0.665 and then some. Now I'm going to copy that formula all the way down the column so that each number, sorry, each room has one of these random numbers. Now to do my random sample, all I'm going to do is sort by the random column. So I highlight all the data by clicking in the upper left column, or the upper left corner of the table, choose data and sort, and then sort the data by the random number that I just created. Click OK. And now I have the rooms in a random order. So all I have to do now is choose the first 25 on the list. I can do that easily by choosing a, or typing a 1 and a 2 and then using my mouse to highlight and copy that 1 and 2 down until I get 25 right there. I could do it all the way down the column but there's really no, re no, no need to in this case. So these first 25 rooms here are a random sample of all 550 plus dorm rooms. These are the ones that we could go and, and, uh, and, and sample our, our temperatures from. So that's a quick and easy way to draw a random sample using Microsoft Excel. The very first thing you'll need to do is install the Data Analysis Tool Pack add-in from Microsoft Excel. Note that this is available only for the PC version of Microsoft Excel. There is no version of this for the Macintosh version of Excel. To tell whether or not the tool pack is installed, you can go to the data ribbon and look over here. If there is nothing here, then the tool pack is not installed. To get it there, though, it's pretty easy. Click on File and then choose uh, Options. and then choose add-ins and down here Excel add-ins. Click Go. And the add-ins dialog box will pop up. You just need to make sure that Analysis Tool Pack and Analysis Tool Pack VBA are both checked. And then click OK. When you do that, as you can see, the data analysis uh, option pops up there on the far right on the data ribbon and you've just installed the data analysis tool pack. Yours may take a little bit longer to install. Mine installed pretty quickly because I just uninstall it for purposes of this video. But it typically finishes in 30 seconds or less. So that's how to install the data analysis tool pack so that you're ready to do the, the, the analyses that you'll be seeing in, in this video. In this spreadsheet, we have made up temperatures for 25 dormitory rooms. And what we're going to do with this data set is we're going to use um, Microsoft Excel's data analysis tool pack to determine whether the universities claim that each of these dormitory rooms averages a, a 68 degree temperature is accurate, is, is supported by the, uh, the observations we've made in these 25 random dormitory rooms. To begin, click the Data tab and come over to find the Data Analysis Tool Pack icon. Again, you have to install this if you haven't already. There's a separate video showing you how to do that. 
So click on the Data Analysis Tool Pack icon, and up comes the Data Analysis dialog box. Just scroll through here until you find the Descriptive Statistics procedure. Highlight that and choose OK. And the very first thing we need to do is tell Excel what data we want it to analyze. So if I could click over here on the right side of the box, I can now come highlight all the data in column A, including the heading, by the way, the, the temps heading right there at the top. And enter on the keyboard gets us back to the dialog box. Because I included the heading, choose the labels in first row box right there. And then choose an output range. By default, you can have, it, have Excel send the results to a new worksheet. I prefer to have the results sent to the same worksheet where the data are. So I'm going to highlight the radio button next to output range and then click in the box there next to output range and then click on wherever I want the, the data to show up. How about C1 right here? And now we need to tell Excel what results we want. Summary statistics, check that. And also check confidence level for the mean. And you can leave the 95% there that shows up by default. That'll be just fine. When you're finished, click OK. And Excel will produce some output. I'm going to widen the columns here so I can see everything clearly. And there are a lot of statistics here, but there really are two that I'm most interested in. The mean, which is 63.48 degrees Fahrenheit, and what Excel calls the confidence level, 95%. In this case, about a degree and a half, 1.5. What I want to do is take the mean and add the confidence level to it and also subtract the confidence level from it. And that'll give us the range that uh, the range of dorm temperatures that we could reasonably expect to to include the average given these observations in these in these 25 random rooms. So we have to do a little bit of formula writing, but it's not difficult. Let's start with some labels here. Let's go upper limit like that and maybe lower limit. And then in the upper limit uh, cell right next to the label, type an equal sign to begin a formula. Take the average or the mean and subtract, or I'm sorry, add, add to it the uh, confidence level here. And then hit enter on your keyboard or whatever. And then let's uh, do kind of the opposite for the lower limit. Again, start with an equal sign, get the average in there, hit the minus sign, and subtract from that average the confidence level. So now we can be 95% sure that had we measured the temperature in all of the dormitory rooms, all 250 plus of them, we would have found an average temperature somewhere between 61.9 degrees or basically 62 degrees and 64.9 or basically 65 degrees. So somewhere between 62 and 65 degrees. Notice that that range does not include the 68 degree temperature that the university says is the average temperature in all the dormitory rooms. What does this mean? Well, it means that the dormitory rooms really are colder than the university says they are. We can at least be 95% sure of, of that conclusion. So the only thing left to do now is to write a lead summarizing the findings here so you can get your story started. I would suggest something like this. Holder B East and West residents aren't imagining the chilly temperatures in their dorm rooms, an investigation by the Metropolitan suggests. The temperatures in 25 randomly selected rooms averaged 63.5 degrees yesterday and indicated that the average temperature for all rooms in the two dorms was no warmer than 65 degrees and possibly as cold as 62 degrees. There was only about a 5% chance that the heating system serving the two residence halls was consistently delivering temperatures closer to the 68 degree norm promised by university maintenance officials. You'll need to have two spreadsheets open for this exercise. Both are downloadable from the website. The first one shows the results of the dormitory poll that we've conducted. Uh, th this is a poll asking dormitory residents whether they favor or oppose the new housing policy or whether they don't know how they feel about the policy. The other spreadsheet, again you can download this also from the website, 
is a special one I've created for you that you can use to calculate an error margin around a, a percentage. Now the first thing we need to do is find out how many students favor the new policy, how many oppose it, and how many don't know. You could do this a lot of ways. You could use subtotaling, for example. You could just use sorting and, and manually counting up. But I think the fastest and easiest way to do it is going to be to use a pivot table. Uh, and you've, you've already had some exposure to pivot tables, but uh, just by way of a refresher, you hit the insert button and you choose pivot table and then pivot table again. And Excel is going to take a guess at what data you want to use. In this case, it looks like it guessed correctly. You could manually select it if you needed to. But, um, uh, but that looks correct. Let's put the output in the existing worksheet. And I'm going to select a location by clicking on the location box and then clicking on the cell that I want the results to appear. And let's, let's just pick E2 here. It's convenient. And click OK. When I do that, the pivot table dialog box opens up. And uh, let's see, let's put the vote, that's what we want to count, in the row labels box and also in the sum of values box. And while I was doing that, you can see that Excel was building this little pivot table telling us how, how much of each type of answer we have, how many of each type of answer we have. We have 16 students who said they don't know, 93 who said they favor the new policy, and 61 who said they oppose the new policy. Okay, these are the values that you need to plug into this spreadsheet. Let's, uh, let's, put the number, let, let's consider the number of successful observations as the number who favor the policy, uh, just to keep it straight. You can do this either way, but let's go with favor. Uh, so that would be 93. Just type it in. And the number of unsuccessful observations, that would be the number who oppose the policy, in this case 61. We can ignore the 16 don't knows for purposes of this exercise. They don't know how they, they feel, so, so we, don't, we don't really know either. Uh, but we have 61 opposed. Let's put them here. Okay, and when you hit enter, the spreadsheet will do all the calculations for you. Uh, it will tell you that the um, uh, that we can be 95% sure that if we had talked to all of the dorm residents, that somewhere between 52% and 68% of them would have said that they favor the the new policy. Uh, so that is uh, uh, high, the, even the lowest possible percentage, 52%, or the lowest probable percentage, 52%, is still higher than the 50% needed for the policy to pass. So the best prediction is that if this election were held right now, we can be 95% sure that it would pass with uh, at least 52% uh, approval, probably probably closer to, uh, to somewhere halfway between 52% and 68%. Now that you've computed the confidence interval, the only thing left to do is to write up the results in a way that, that will make sense to, to readers. I would suggest something like this. Holder B East and West residents support letting guests stay longer on weeknights and overnight on weekends, a poll by the Metropolitan indicates. 55% of 170 randomly selected Holder B East and West residents said they supported the move, while 36% opposed it and 9% had no opinion. The scientifically valid poll's error margin indicates that at least 52% and possibly as many as 68% of all Holder B residents presently support the change from the current policy. The current policy prohibits visitors after 6 p.m. on any night of the week. There is only about a 5% chance that the proportion of residents favoring the change is higher or lower than the range estimated by the poll.